is William de la Rance, the ghostwriter for today's modern black religions. going on party people the place to be i go by the name of the bk apologies transmitting all the way live from new york is the city brooklyn is the borough what's good what's popping hope everybody's having a nice safe mok day uh definitely appreciate all the things that mr king has done for for us um you know and we get to uh you know relish in in the strides that he made and may we continue to um continue those strides as we you know fight for equality you know and uh I see the party people are coming into the chat we got bodega lady d new on the check-in we got my man Romy rome we got joel we got my boy bats built for speed is in the building of course we got the real american mr phil fox man 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 as always if you have not yet already please like share and subscribe to the channel please share the link to wherever you roam in these interwebs. And if you like how it goes down with the BK, you can send a little donation via PayPal. You could consider it a, a belated birthday present. So my birthday was this past Friday. And thank you everybody who has shown love to me this weekend, definitely appreciate that. And if you wanna be a monthly uh, supporter of BK, you could become a patron where you will get an assortment of theological treats for your personal Bible study. And of course, I am being joined with, you know, a very, very sharp and astute young man who loves the Lord and also loves violence at the same time. Of course, I'm talking about none other than MJ Jackson. What's going on? Grace and peace to you, uh, big brother. Happy belated birthday. Thank Be you. Sending some love your way here soon. Um, Yes, I do love violence, especially on MLK Day. And I'm just <laughs> sitting back. And if I see any uh, watering down of Dr. Martin Luther King, I just may come for whoever. Today. Wow. Well, um, I'm I'm kind of seeing seeing some things on Twitter that I don't like. So you know, people on the left and people on the right trying to pimp Dr. Martin Luther King. We're not going to do that. Because I get to throwing out some quotes that sound like CRT and mess up everybody. <laughs> but we're going to do it in peace and love. In peace so, and love. Uh, and truth. <laughs> and truth. <God. laughs> and speaking of some truth, um, you know, me and MJ, you know, all of last year have been really, you know, taking a deep dive in various forms of um, black theologies and ideologies. And the thing that we've been finding time and time again, which surprises me, MJ, is that behind the curtain, pulling the strings, is usually a white man. You know, now, for the believer, for the Christians, right, it doesn't matter where truth resides as long as truth is truth. You know, if Jesus came from Scandinavia, then God bless Scandinavia. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter for us because we just want to be right with God. However he wanted to put these people and this planet, that's up to God. That's his sovereign will. We don't care. But the reason why we bring it up is because many people in the conscious community love to, to uh, accuse us of embracing a white man's religion. But the hypocrisy in that is that when we start taking a look at their various ideologies, guess who shows up? The, the white man. And we will be talking more about that as well. As you know, we, we've talked about Trish Magistus on various um, videos. We've talked about Plutarch, you know. And today, we're going to be talking about an individual by the name of William de Laurence. We've mentioned him on a few other channels, uh, not channels, uh, videos. Um, one we did about Yaku. He shows up in Yaku. He also shows up on the One West Hebrew Israelites as well. We're going to touch a little bit on that as well. So, MJ, before we continue, before we get on, um, like, what's your take on, you know, when we, we, we open the veil a little bit, you know, we start seeing people like this. Like, what's your thoughts on that? 
Uh, I'm not surprised. Um, I'm not. I'm not surprised. Uh, most of the mythicists and most of the, um, you know, most of of the the mystics, you know, that you pick up a book and read were were of European descent. Um, you know, people on the continent of Africa didn't really have a problem with Christianity, and I defy. Um, I defy anybody who disagrees to, you know, prove it. I mean, this, you know, it wasn't a big deal for for uh, Aboriginal and Native Africans. You know, if I can use that term African, you know, even mm -hmm. that came from a European. Mm. Um, but I mean, this is this is their their standard is, hey. If it come from white people, it got to be wrong. This is right. their standard. Right. This is not our standard. Right. And so we're just simply saying, okay, let's hold you to that consistently. And when we do that, you know, we see people like Cursey Graves. We see uh, Albert Churchward. Albert Churchward. We see uh, all kind, all all kinds of European crazy folk just start popping up. Godfrey Higgins. Godfrey uh, Higgins. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I'm just going to say this, you know, I, I think folks in the conscious community, uh, thought leaders, if we can call them that, they are taking advantage. Number one, I think that they have been taken advantage of. Number two, they are taking advantage of the ignorance of their audience. And it also just goes to show if you sound like you know what you can you can sound like you know what you're talking about. Let's call it performing. Okay. So we got to move beyond what's performative and move to what's what's uh, substantive. Yeah, we can't forget our boy Coon. Yep, can't forget <laughs> him. <laughs> but all right, so let's let's get into it. So with Mr. Delance, you know, he's written many many books. But the one I'm actually most familiar with, and it didn't, it's funny, I didn't make the connection until I started doing my research, but um, there's a particular book that he wrote called The Sixth and Seventh Books of Moses. Now, I, you know, as you guys know, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. And growing up in Brooklyn, you know, whether it's downtown Brooklyn, Fulton Street, 125th Harlem, Fulton Road in the Bronx, you know, you'll see like these open air uh, booksellers. And, you know, in, in the hood, you know, you're going to find a lot of these black esoteric books. And I've seen these books my whole life, you know, and I found them very strange. If you go to any, like, black-owned bookstore and you go into, like, the black esoteric section, you know, you'll find this book all the time. I've seen this my whole life. And I didn't realize how important this book has been to various modern iterations of black religions. You know, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And in doing so, we will be looking at this paper by Patrick A. Polk called Other Books, Other Powers, The Six and Seven Books of Moses in Afro-Atlantic Folk Belief. And NJ, if you could read this real quick for us. The frequent appearance within the practice of African-American belief system Haitian voodoo, West Indian OB, and African American hoodoo of esoteric occult, uh, alchemical, and herbal texts, particularly those closely associated with European magic or sorcery, has long been noted by scholars. The evocative titles and tomes used in Haiti, for example, conjure forth uh, fantastic and mystical images. Uh, Le Dragon Rouge. Le Grand et uh, Pete Petit Albert, Albert. <laughs> uh, Le Liver des uh, seven, 72, 72 Genus La Pouli, uh, Nor. Noir. Oh my God, these are. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> these are French. <laughs> <laughs> uh, English language versions of these uh, comparable tracks, including the Great and Lesser Keys of Solomon, the Book of Black Magic, and Pax. The sixth and seventh book of Moses are likewise used. Um, New World, mostly uh, notably Jamaica, Trinidad, uh, Trinidad the United, States. And the United States, Hurston, uh, Hyatt, and Powdermaker, Smith, Snow, and Winslow. Corresponding mm -hmm. uh, grimories published in Spanish 
and Portuguese are also popular among adherents of Afro-Cuban and Afro-Brazilian religions. Right. These various um, grimoires, you know, that, that are European are time and time again found, you know, within these Afro-Cuban and Afro-Brazilian religions. And he says here, my intent in this essay is to advance the level of discourse concerning the utilization of European grimoires within African-American belief systems by moving beyond the brief and generally superficial commentaries that have addressed the issue to date. In particular, I examined the widespread, the widespread use of the six or seven book of Moses, perhaps the most influential Gnostic value within the Afro-Atlantic cultural continuum. Although the work is frequently mentioned by scholars, few have shown much interest in assessing how Africans and African Americans interpret the book's value as a source of sacred knowledge. Its utility as a liturgical device and its historical relationship to both African and European religious traditions. By examining the popularity of the volume within the broader Afro-Atlantic cultural milieu, and by expanding on points made by researchers working in Africa, the Caribbean, and the United States, I hope to show that the far-reaching utilization of the tomb exemplifies the generative development of creolized systems of knowledge. <clears throat> so what the writer wants to do is really show and unpack the impact that this, this specific European grimoire had in the cultivating and the evolution of a lot of these um, Afro-Cuban, uh, Afro-Atlantic religions that a lot of us have left the church for. I mean, I, well, he doesn't say that. I'm going to add that part, right? We, we, a lot of us left the church for what we think is a genuine, uh, authentic African experience. But what we're realizing is the backbone to these so-called African experiences are uh, books such as the six and seven books of Moses. Um, your thoughts, MJ, before we continue. Now, this is uh, this is heavy, eye-opening stuff. And, um, you know, it just takes a little bit of time to dig and mm -hmm. a thirst and hunger for, for truth. And I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we should not be concerned with uh, what's quote-unquote black or what's quote-unquote white, but what's true. Right. And we should be willing to go after what's true. Amen to that. So let's let's continue. Uh, an anonymous occult treatise, the sixth and seventh book of Moses, is believed to have appeared in print in Germany in 1797. <clears throat> During the ensuing centuries, multiple editions of the volume have enjoyed much popularity throughout Western Europe and ultimately the world. Presented as a compendium of authentic abstracts selected from the corpus of Hebraic sacred texts, the work is a collection of Kabbalah-like taxonomies of amulets, incantations, and prayers attributed to Moses and other Hebrew patriarchs. As its title implies, the volume is reputedly an addendum to the canonical books of Moses, i.e. the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That was left out of the Old Testament, hence it's frequently referred to as the lost books of Moses. So this is where we get the title from, right? It, it's, it's supposed to be, you know, added to the, the five books of the Torah, but for some reason, you know, it was taken out of the of the Bible, you know, because, you know, because of reasons. Right. So. Um, so that's that's the whole origin. Like these, these are lost books that we found. Right. The most common English language edition of the six or seven books of Moses is published and distributed by De Laurent's Company of Chicago, Illinois, founded by William Laurent De Laurent's at the beginning of the 20th century. The company markets occult paraphernalia including standard ma magical tombs such as the greater key of solomon the lesser key of solomon and dilaran's own book of magical art hindu ritual and indian occultism based loose loosely on 19th century german volumes the dilaran's edition of the six or seven books of moses is profusely illustrated with drawings of pseudo hebraic seals and talismans and includes an anonymous essay entitled The Magic of the Israelites, an excerpt from the Calvicola of Solomon, the King of Israel, by Andrew Lucas, dated 1686, a track entitled 
uh, Sefer Samush Teflim, or the use of the Psalms for the physical welfare of man, translated from the practical cabal of Gottfried Selig in 1788. There's a lot, a lot of white folk here. There's lots <laughs> of white people here. And finally, another essay entitled Astrological Influence Upon Man and Magical Cures of the Old Hebrews, taken from Dr. Breachy's work, The Transcendental Magic and Magical Healing Art in the Talmud, putatively published in Vienna in 1854. So we're, we're getting a, a gist of the, the source material that makes up this book from Deuterans. You know, a lot of pseudo Hebraic magical Gwim Raws and the you know Lesser King of Solomon. We've we've seen those books before in the streets, right? So all of this is 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 part and parcel of of what makes up this particular book here. Uh, since its appearance during the first decade of the 20th century, the Delarant edition has been distributed primarily via mail order, with significant sales recorded in Africa and the Caribbean. In Africa, the use of the book has been noted in Cameroon, Ghana. Nigeria, South Africa, and other nations. In the Caribbean, researchers have encountered the tomb in Jamaica, uh, Segra, Grenada, Monastrat, St. Vincent, and Trinidad. In conjunction with his mail order publishing business, Delorance also established the Delorance Institute of Hypnotism and Occult Philosophy. Together, the two enterprises garnered him much regional and international acclaim and exerted significant influence on religious developments on both sides of the Atlantic. So we know some of the source material that makes up this book from Deuterans. And now we know where it traveled, where this book migrated to via mail order publishing company that he had. And one of the major uh, receivers of this particular piece of literature was in Africa and the Caribbean. Right? So that so, which is very interesting, right? Because a lot of the most modern iterations of these black religions are coming from the Caribbean and Africa, right? But they had this particular book to, to uh, digest, and we're going to see how it's been implemented in these belief systems, right? Uh, anything you want to say before we continue, MJ? No, <laughs> we can keep going. All right, cool. Elsewhere in Nigeria, uh, Dr. Candito of India, an Igbo traditional healer and devotee of the water spirit Mama Wata, possessed two books that he ordered from the Dero Lines Company, the Greater Books of Magic and the Six and Seven Books of Moses. Concerning these publications, Efe Bunke not only stated that he used the works in his worship and considered Dero Lines to be, quote, a very knowledgeable man, but he also that he wished to visit him in America. So here we see this book that comes from European grimoires being used in the, the worship of Mama Mami Wata, right? Something that people consider a organic and authentic African religion. But one of the main practitioners is actually saying that, well, a lot of my stuff that I use in order to, to do my, my thing when it comes to Mama Wata comes from the great book of magic and the sixth and book of Moses. Which, shocker, not African in origin. So that's one thing right there. So Mama Wata, the, the practitioner, is using these books in his worship and, and, and his religion of Mami Wata. In Jamaica, some consider Deloran to be the world's finest magician and a super guru. Not surprising, one of Robert A. Hill's informant, informants in the study of the emergence of Rastaf Rastafarianism in Jamaica, during the 1930s, stated, if you weren't reading Dead on Arms in those days, you weren't considered to be doing anything great. So we see that it had a great you know, influence in the belief of Mama Wata. But here we see that Dead on was part of this evolution of what we now know as Rastafarianism. So that's two already, right? That's Mama Wata and Rastafarianism. Throughout Africa and the Caribbean, colonial regimes and post-colonial governments have banned the six and seven books of Moses, most likely due to the violence popularity among practitioners of indigenous spiritual traditions. So let's stop there for a minute. 
the government in the Caribbean Africa wanted to ban the books because the books were being used by practitioners of indigenous spiritual traditions. So if you are partaking in these modern iterations of these indigenous spiritual traditions, guess what you're also partaking in as well? The sixth and seventh book of Moses, right? As well as the members of syncretic movements such as Aldura, the spiritual Baptist faith, and Rastafarian foreignism. Within the context of Eurocentric political hegemony, these religious behaviors have often been indistinguishable from acts of resistance, if not sedition. Furthermore, from the perspective of missionaries, always key figures in colonial structures of power, the Delorance volume smacked of rank occultism, acceptance of dangerous European superstitions, and the subversion of clerical authority. Now, the missionaries had a different issue, right? They felt like these things were, were taken away from their political power. Now, they dressed it with all oh, well, what's false doctrine. We got to stump it out. But it was more about, you know, they were losing power off of these books. Okay? So, but these books were being used by indigenous spiritual traditions. MJ, anything to add? Um... I mean, wow, that's, that's a lot there. It's, it's a lot of political <laughs> history as well. Um, <sighs> we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. Yeah, just, okay. just let you know how much you really don't know. <laughs> you know, but, but it also, I mean, also with the construction of these laws of books of Moses and, and things like that, it, it, it also shows you, number one, that Delarance understood the authority that the Bible had to mm -hmm. even come up mm -hmm. with an idea that, hey, what if I told people I got these lost books? That's a good point. Of Moses. I mean, you are you hear it all the time. I'm gonna show you. I mean, the Hebrew Israelites do it. I'm gonna show you something that your pastor did not tell you. Right, right, or, right, or, right. Or I'm gonna show you this that you don't know. And look. Don't be moved by that. Don't be swayed by that. We we live in the age of the internet. Go research it. Go question it. I mean, come on now. I mean, but it's just a shame how people will try to use quote unquote knowledge to enslave people. Facts. That's a great point, bro. So to continue here, uh, when the volume has been officially proscribed, individuals found to have it in the procession have been prosecuted by the civil authorities. In November of 1915, for example, a man who brought the trial in Kingston, Jamaica, on the charge that he was practicing witchcraft, Obe, describing the suspect as a, quote, 20th century Oberman, the local paper reported that the police have seized as evidence not only the customary Obe paraphernalia, such as feathers, grave, dirty, human bones, but also magic books, including, wait for it, the six assembled <laughs> books of Moses. Right? This was part of his spiritual arsenal. This European occult magic. Okay? It's making the rounds. W.E. Elkins argues that many spirits recognized by the members of the revival Zion, Kumina, and convents congregations were introduced via the use of the Lamont's publications. Furthermore, as Robert A. Hill suggests, the six or seven books of Moses and similar grimoires may have been instrumental in sustaining the early development of Rastafarianism. So Bob Marley and these dudes, you know, chop down Babylon and all that. Well, if you go in their libraries, you're going to find a whole bunch of white occult grimoires, specifically this one by De Laurence. Right? Because a lot of people think, you know, if you embrace Rastafarianism, you're embracing some form of African, African spirituality. No. Actually, you're you're not. There might be some secretive aspects of African religion, but one of the main components is this book right here. All right. So this is a um, an interview of an informant that the writer had, <coughs> and he's talking about a practitioner <clears throat> that practiced hoodooism. Hoodoo is, as many of us know. A, a American derivative of voodoo, right? Hoodoo is very much a, a, a African American version of that. So it says here by informant 786, hoodooism, 
started way back in the time that Moses days, right? Back in all ancient times, 9,000 years ago. Now you see Moses, he was a prophet, like Peter, Paul, and James. And then he quit being a prophet and started doing hoodooism. What we call the seven books of Moses, they were hoodooism talk about. So this is a practitioner of hoodooism. And this is what he's saying, is that Moses was a prophet, but then he flipped and then he started doing hoodooism. And the reason why they know that is because of this book. He woke up. He, the, the, the Great Awakening. <laughs> <laughs> the Great Awakening. All right. Let's, let's, let's continue. Now, it's like I'm better with a man. He's giving an example of how this works. He says, now, like, I'm better with a man. Or you owe a man some money. You haven't got any money and you don't want to be worried with his arguing for it. You take his name and you write it and wear it in your left shoe. And you never be worried with that man. Well, that's who do it. Or just like you want to get a piece of money from me and you say, if I go to him, he won't let me handle it. Well, you walk right down here to the drugstore and get you a piece of John D. Conquer root and you come to me chewing, chewing gum or you're chewing tobacco. But yet you spent that atmosphere from your mouth, your breath, that chew letting out draws influence of me, make me do things that I don't want to do. Because the power is stronger in my mind. You see, that's hoodooism. You see, but hoodooism came about. The foundation of hoodooism come from way back yonder. The times that Moses written the book. The seven books of Moses. This is a practitioner of hoodooism. Talking about the different you know, spells you can use when you're in different situations. You owe money to somebody. Or even the flip side, someone trying to get money from me. They could do this to me. But... All this comes from the seven book of Moses. This is from a practitioner of, of, of this of Hoodooism. You're saying that this comes from this book, this book that comes from Germany in, the, in the originally. European occult magic somehow finds its way through Africa and the Caribbean and now reemerges in America in the form of Hoodooism. MJ, your thoughts? <laughs> oh, God. I mean, all throughout the Bible, you, you have prohibitations against witchcraft. This is witchcraft. It's manipulation. Um, you know, we can look at the quote-unquote declarations in Kemet, which are really nothing more than spells designed to manipulate their gods. And and why do you see such a uh, such a um, why 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 do you see such an outlawing of that in the biblical worldview? Because you wasn't manipulating Yahweh, and you certainly was not going to manipulate each other. Witchcraft mm -hmm. is is a form of manipulation, and you know to say that there are six or seven books of Moses that you can tack alongside. Uh, the original books of Moses as well, you know, we're going to come in an impasse and we're going to, you know, just thinking logically, you know, you, you, you have contradiction here. You got a big old contradiction. Right. And when you have a contradiction, you don't have truth. So who's lying? Why would Moses contradict himself? Right. But uh, I like what you said about, you know, trying to you know manipulate the situation because that's a great segue for this quote right here because it says in essence the six and seven books of moses facilitates the adaptation of the bible in such a way as to make it more readily accessible as a tool of working hoodoo by enabling individuals to directly apply scripture the psalms in particular to the ex exigencies of life in an effective manner Sacred words gleaned by way of Moses are uh, uttered by the faithful in hopes of bringing about desired conditions or to counteract undesirable circumstances. So this westernized, Americanized form of voodoo, hoodoo, comes directly from a book of, of, of that derives itself from various German occult grimoire. Nothing mm -hmm. African about this, guys. No. 
at all. In their use of the sixth and seventh book of Moses, adherents of African-American spiritual traditions such as voodoo, obey, and hoodoo have not, as some scholars have supposed, simply retained an outdated European pattern of magical thought. Rather, they have co-opted and adapted available metaphysical resources as part of the process of creating integrated belief systems that reflect and address the emotional, environmental, and social realities faced by adherents on a daily basis. That's powerful. Right? Did he give it lip service? They incorporated this book and made it part of their metaphysical response to their situation. Right? Why am I being oppressed? Why is there white supremacy? Why is it so hard for me to move on with my life because of the color of my skin? There's something I got to use to fight against this. And what they decided to use was the sixth and seventh book of Moses, as opposed to the gospel. Right. Let me continue here. Um, that reflect and address the emotional, environmental, and social realities faced by adherents on a daily basis. In some, the popularity of the six and seven books of Moses throughout the African Atlantic cultural continuum can be attributed to a number of factors. The most notable being one, the wide acceptance of the volume as an authentic mosaic text. Two, the book's emphasis on the utility of the Bible and scripture in rites, rituals, and magical procedures. Three, the increasingly positive violation of literacy and the written word. Four, Delorant's reputation as a man of great spiritual knowledge and power. And five, counterproductive effects of censorship. Right? The reason why people were able to gravitate towards this was because it had some semblance to the Bible. Right? No difference than when we see these Hebrews every Saturday, right, trying to give you answers about why you're in the condition that you're in. And they'll use the Bible, completely misquote and misuse it, but they know that if people hear the Bible, well, it must be true then. If they're quoting scripture, it must be true what they're saying. They've been doing this since the sixth book of Moses. That's why it, it, it stuck. That's why it's still here. Because it utilizes, like what you said earlier, MJ, they utilize the Bible in a manner that it was never meant to be used. But because they're using the Bible in some way, it must be authentic. It must be real. Yeah. Your thoughts, MJ? Yeah, there's, there's nothing new under the sun. And um, like I said, we see this with the Nation of Islam, how before they even dropped the Quran on you, they was dropping bible scriptures on on a lot of black folks uh because it just commanded such respect and with this um it's no different and of course it goes back a little bit further but it's no different and right. so i mean there, there has to be a little something to the bible um right b but you know i mean hopefully uh you know hopefully people just take up and acknowledge these patterns that we're seeing right and it's not just mommy water. It's just not Rastafarianism. Yeah. And it's not just hoodooism either. Because, and I'll share this in another video, but this is from a paper called I Saw You Disappear in My Own Eyes, Hidden Transcripts of New York Black Israelite Brockledge by Jacob S. Dorman. Mm. He says, this Black Israelite slash New Thought theology was based on the works of French-American author and publisher William Laurent de Laurence who made his name by translating and publishing magical works from around the Oriental world. His books have been widely circulated and remain highly respected among practitioners of African Atlantic religions, such as Santeria and Voodoo. The De Laurent's works play critical roles in the genesis of 20th century alternative African American religions, such as Morris Science Temple, Black Islam, Rabbi Matthews Black Judaism, and Leonard Harrell's Rastafarianism. Moorish, Temple, Black Hebrew Israelites, Rastafarianism. All use this book as a starting point and part of their building blocks of their ideology. Oh, and let me not forget this, Santeria and Voodoo as well. They're all using the same playbook 
They just wear different jerseys when they go on the field, but they're all using the same playbook, fam. All right. Um, Rabbi Matthew used Delorance writing to create magical rituals and mm. a quote Hebraic creed that allowed him to be filled with God's spirit. Matthew based what he called his Kabbalistic science on the most popular of Delorance books, the sixth and seventh book of Moses. You know, Rabbi Matthew, a precursor to today's one West Hebrew Israelite ideology. This is their origin story. Dramatic white European magical grimoires. Right? Matthew's personal papers in the Schoenberg Library in New York include two amulets of geometric design and Hebrew words borrowed in part from the sixth and seventh book of Moses. These amulets offer an unparalleled view into the hidden transcript in the private settings where Rabbi Matthew performed the most secret transformative rituals at the hidden heart of black Israelism. This dude was getting his Dr. Strange on in private. All right? And, and here's an example of that. This is a square amulet in Matthew's personal papers was modified from the second temple of table of the spirit of fire found on page 16 where on the sixth and seventh book of moses this guy was creating incantations and spells when nobody was looking <laughs> right your rabbi so you know again when we start looking we start digging a little deeper we find some very interesting origins for the modern iterations of black religious cults. And we keep seeing the same name. We keep seeing De La Rance. De La Rance. So when you say Ja Rastafari, you really should be saying De La Rance. <laughs> <laughs> right? Morris Science Temple, De La Rance. You are Santero? You weren't all white? De La Rance. You're into hoodoo? De La Rance. <laughs> you know? Mm -mm -mm. You're one West Hebrew Israelite? De La Rance. De La Rance. All day. So why we share all this? It's because we know that many black and brown people have been swayed by a lot of these belief systems. And there's this, this, this feeling, this urge of, you know, I, I want a... a an authentic African spiritual experience. So they run off to these various ideologies. But the sad thing is, you're, you're, you're given a, a, a false bill of goods. None of these iterations of today's black religions are authentic African religions. They co-opted and they're utilizing European occult magic. Whether you're Rastafari, whether you're Mama Wata, Obe, Hebrew, whether you're Moor, you're Santero, all of you, all of these ideologies are integrating and adapted German slash European occult magic. And they slapped on some kente cloth. And they showing it to you as if this is a this this is your religion, mm. black black man. It's not true. And again, for believers, not that it matters where the truth lies, but if you're really looking for an authentic African experience, stay in the church. <laughs> your ancestors in ancient Kemet, when they heard the gospel, they embraced it without the rest without the sword on their necks. Many of your enslaved ancestors in this country already came here knowing the gospel. And they knew the difference between authentic gospel and the nonsense their masters were trying to shove down their throats. They knew the difference. So the gospel is an authentic African experience. Why? Because your African ancestors believed it was. They right, so it's like 
And a lot of us, we know, we love to honor and give, you know, give honor to the ancestors. Well, your ancestors embrace the gospel. <clears throat> African kings, we love, we was kings. <laughs> King Azana embraced the gospel when he heard it, it from two of his servants. African king gravitated and embraced the gospel. So, you know, that's that's what I want to share um, today. Um, MJ, I know you got some, some thoughts here. Nah, I couldn't have said that better than, uh, myself. I mean, if you want, like you said, if you want an authentic African experience, I mean, look no further than uh, Christianity. I know that strikes a nerve, right? Because you have been sold... Uh, you you have been sold a bill of goods that said that Christianity was the white man's religion and that it's been beaten into your ancestors. But there's there's nothing more refreshing than to read the slave narratives. There's nothing more refreshing than to read uh, Frederick Douglass's speeches and some of his memoirs. There's nothing more refreshing than to read a Henry Highland Garnett. There's nothing more refreshing than to read. Uh, these ancestors in their own words. And I know it's embarrassing. These ancestors are embarrassments to um, folks within the conscious community because they would have us to believe that these are anomalies and that they were just using Christianity as a cultural crutch. But nothing can be further from the truth. Whenever there are, there is cultural conflict that arises, Look, Christianity is, has the firmest ground for morality, for righteousness, for for logic, for all of that. And so, I mean, you want to win, join Team Jesus. Seriously. Right. Let me share this one more time. Let me share this one particular slide one more time. Right? Delorance works play critical roles. This is not something they read in passing. Critical roles in the genesis, the beginning, right, of 20th century alternative African-American religions such as Morris Science Temple's Black Islam, Rabbi Matthew's Black Judaism, and Leonard Howe's Rastafarianism. Critical. It was part of the beginning of these belief systems. This white man right there that you see. He was critical to the establishment of the so-called black religions. Now, now, what are you going to do with that? Now, you can believe what you want. You are free to believe. But don't hit me with, you know, these are black religions. They're not. They're not. If that's what you're looking for, you need to leave these things. Because when you look behind the veil... You see this, this, this nicely coiffed mustache white individual by the name of De Laurent. All right. And a lot of us gravitate to these things. You're gravitating towards something that's overtly white. <laughs> like it, this is, this is white, white. All right. There's nothing African. There's nothing Semitic. There's nothing, nothing white, nothing African here. There's Germanic. Grimoire, occult, magic. All right. Just, just really want to double down on that. So, um, yeah, Shadi said something dope here. She said, "Not only do the narratives and testimony of Black Christians show they were far from ignorant, but these people were also far from ignorant." So, right. And she, she continued, in fact, many slave owners didn't want the slaves to become Christian. That's facts. Because it increased their desire to fight for freedom. Right? So, <laughs> Eric says, wait, the Hebrew Israelites learned from Esau? Man, Esau was the backbone. He was the <laughs> cornerstone. <laughs> he was day one. He was their day one. Mr. De Laurence. They couldn't do it without him. Yep, he was the cornerstone. <laughs> they need to give him they he they they owe him money. You know what I mean? It's like it's 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 that's where it is. So for a lot of us, you know, 
we've had bad experiences in church. I did too. You know, I de I definitely have church hurt stories as well, right? And sometimes we and some some of our church hurt does deal with race and not being able to get along with our white brothers and sisters, right? And then we hear these other ideologies and we start believing that, well, maybe the reason why I'm having a tough time with the church or with the Bible because it was never meant for me, right? That's what people tell you. It's not your religion. That's why you're having such a hard time. Come over here. Like, this is where we, this is our religion. Come to the Morse Temple. Come to 125th Street, 1 West. Come to the, you know, the, the, the Santeros, you know, get, 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 get linked up with Mama Wata. And it sounds good. And it scratches that, that itch you have that the Bible talks about. But if you do your research, as the people like to say, right, do your research. You got bamboozled and led astray. Because none of those ideologies have anything to do with Africa. So it is what it is. And yes, Amir. So Hebrew spreading the doctrine of Esau. Now, I don't know if, to be fair now, I don't know if many of these practitioners know their own origins. You know, some of them do, and they're not saying anything. But that's a whole different thing. But I'm sure many people who are in these ideologies, they're very sincere. They're very sincere people. You know what I mean? <laughs> but you could be sincere and be wrong. You know, so MJ, man, so again, uh, we're about to wrap this up. Any any final thoughts about what we just discussed today? Yeah. Um, please wake up. If you're on the other side of the conversation and, uh, you know, you've been led to believe that this stuff is... <laughs> thoroughly African, you've come across books like these by our mm. good friend Anthony Browder. Mm. <laughs> you might want to check some of the sources, B. You know, you come across stuff like this by Yosef Binyakinen. You might uh -oh. want to, you, uh -oh. might wanna, you might want to, you know, come, you know, dig a little deeper because, you know, you've been bamboozled, you've been hoodwinked and swindled, you've been led astray. You know, and, and you know, we don't have time to be uh, waddling in, in ignorance. I mean, it's time to wake up and, and embrace the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't want to, that's your choice. But don't be believing lies. You know, be be an be a informed unbeliever, <laughs> at least. Yep. Got to check the sources, man. Yeah. You know, it's funny, right? Because, you know, we get into these conversations with people in these various Facebook groups. And when you challenge their claims, the first thing they want to tell you is do your research. Well, guess what? We've taken that to heart. Me and MJ and others in the UA, we have been doing our research. And man, oh, man, your claims have been found. We've, they've been weighed, they've been measured, and they've been found wanting. Okay? You guys need to do your research. Because we're not the ones being deceived out here. It's, it's you. So, you know, that's just that's, that's, that's the truth of the matter. But again, MJ, what can we be expecting from you in your immediate future? Uh, I'll be coming on um, your channel uh, today, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we got that little scrappy challenge coming up too, yep. if I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I have been, you know, please, everybody, if you could just keep my family uh, in your prayers. I've been, you know, dealing with a, a few family issues. It's been kind of derailing um, my YouTube life along <laughs> with my school life. Um, but we'll be seeking to get back on track and, and at least produce uh, some consistent uh, content with my brother, uh, apologist in Detroit. Nice. Uh you know, we just like to offer some commentary and really fill that void of social commentary uh, on some of the uh, the issues in society. Um, you know, and so we want to be be your your Christian voice within the uh, within the in the UA 
for that type of content. We try to put out some stuff like that, but yeah, everybody can blame me, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting back on schedule and we'll be trying to put out some, some content here this week, at least. Sounds good. Sounds good. So yeah, so please um, make sure you guys tune in later on tonight. Uh, me, MJ, Adam Coleman, and I'm thinking even vocab, we're going to be looking once again at um, Jabari Osase's presentation, but we're already going to focus on the virgin birth argument that he has, and we're going to have some comments for that. So with that being said, MJ Jackson and BK sign off. Pigs.